guests, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Hope Harrison. I'm a professor of history and international affairs at the Elliott School at George Washington University. Uh, this is the first, the inaugural um, event in our university seminar on Europe since COVID-19. I'm going to turn over over the screen to my colleague, uh, the Dean of the Elliott School, Alana Feldman. Thank you, Hope, um, and welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, welcome to the Elliott School and to this inaugural event of the University Seminar on Europe since COVID-19. Uh, this University Seminar is being run under the auspices of our Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. And in a time of great transformation across the United States and in the European Union, we are excited and honored to have the opportunity to explore social and political debates, both historical and contemporary, shaping the response to COVID-19. GW, with its engaged student body and experts in history, sociology, languages, cultures, and public policy is uniquely positioned to bring together crucial areas of knowledge from inside and outside the university that can articulate a path forward as we regroup and recover from the events of the past year. So the co-chairs of the university seminar are Hilary Silver, who's a professor of sociology, international affairs, and public policy and public administration. Hope Harrison, who is on screen with us. And as she said, professor of history and international affairs. And also Catherine Kleppinger, who's an associate professor of French and Francophone studies and international affairs. And that mix of people gives you some sense of the interdisciplinary breadth that's being brought to bear on this series. So for their help in setting up this event, I want to thank Matt Culey, who is the Manager of Research Programs at IRIS, and the staff of the German Embassy, especially Vera Boyton, the Director of the German Information Center. We are honored that Ambassador Emily Haber will kick off this university seminar and our Ambassadors Forum Lecture Series. Thank you very much for joining us today. Back to you. Thank you, Alana. It's great to see you. Um, when when um, my colleagues and I, Hillary and Catherine, were brainstorming about how to open up this seminar, uh, we thought it would be perfect to have Ambassador Emily Haber speak to us, not only because Germany is such a key player in Europe, but also because Germany currently holds the rotating presidency of the European Council until December, and because Ambassador Haber has such a fascinating background. She has been here in Washington since June of 2018, and as a history professor, I'm particularly happy to tell you that she holds a PhD in history. Look what you could do with a PhD in history. Her uh, education has been international, attending schools in New Delhi, Bonn, Paris, Brussels, Athens, and here in Washington, D.C. Uh, she earned her Ph.D. at um, the University of Cologne with a dissertation on German foreign policy during the Morocco crisis on the eve of World War I. I'm hoping she doesn't see parallels between our times and the lead up to World War I. Early in her career as a diplomat, Ambassador Haber spent significant time in Russia and the former Soviet Union. She held various posts at the German embassy in Moscow, including head of the political department. Then at the foreign office in Berlin, she served as head of the OSCE division and deputy director for the Western Balkans. Over the past 11 years, she has had several leadership functions at the Foreign Office in Berlin. In 2009, she was appointed political director, and in 2011, she was appointed state secretary, the first woman to hold either post. And the state secretary is the highest position in the Foreign Office short of foreign minister. She was next deployed uh, as a diplomat um, 
to the Federal Ministry of the Interior, where she also served as state secretary in charge of what turned out to be an incredibly important portfolio in charge of homeland security and migration policy from 2014 to 2018. So she was there in that post when the migration crisis hit uh, Germany and Europe in 2015. You could say that she's used to being in the hot spot as DC probably feels now. I'm not sure which would be a more challenging post these days, being ambassador in DC or in Moscow. Uh, we will start today with um, some words from the ambassador uh, about the impact of COVID-19 on Germany and Europe. Um, then she and I will engage in a dialogue um, and then I'll open it up to you all to ask questions. So there is a Q&A um, panel that you can see. Please uh, type in your questions there on the lower right-hand part of your screen. Um, you will see that. Uh, you may see three dots on the bottom. Click on that and it will pull up um, the Q&A. My final words of introduction are of a more personal note. The last time I saw Ambassador Haber in person, she hosted me at her residence for the launch of my book, After the Berlin Wall, uh, dealing with contemporary Germany. For me and for my father, it was an unforgettable evening. I'm so grateful to you, Ambassador Haber, for hosting me and very grateful that you have joined us today. The floor and the screen are yours. Just please unmute yourself. Okay. Is that okay? Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, thank you, Professor Harrison. Thank you, Professor Feldman, for introducing me today. You've Ask me, it's, it's really a great honor and lovely words. So, uh, um, thank you for that. Um, before talking about COVID, let me just say to those in the audience who have had family or friends uh, suffering uh, from uh, COVID or perhaps lost families of uh, family and friends, uh, uh, my deepest condolences. This is a truly difficult time and we're all going through it. To this crisis, there is a threefold layer. There's a national layer, there is a European layer for Europeans at least, but there's also an international layer. And I want to talk about all three of them. And I want to talk about them as the experience that I, uh, with the experience that I acquired uh, when serving in our Homeland Security Ministry uh, as State Secretary. That is as a practitioner. So, People, when pointing to Germany, usually have the vague impression that Germany was fairly well off in dealing with the crisis. Um, truth is, we are at 285 people infected uh, uh, to date. Uh, we have had over 9,400 uh, 9, people dying uh, from the infections, and uh, we see a new surge uh, of cases. It may not seem huge to you, but it is over 2,000 by now uh, uh, every day. And the chancellor has been quoted in an interview. Uh, no, she, it wasn't an interview. She was quoted from uh, an internal conference uh, by um, at the German media today in saying, if we are not careful uh, in uh, uh, containing clusters, clusters such as parties, big gatherings, and, um, football games, etc. We might well be uh, at over 19,000 uh, uh, new infections every day by Christmas. And she was saying that as a warning, which gives you an idea uh, that um, you can always squander uh, um, comparative advantages that you have and we're, we're by, oh, by far uh, not, um, we've not left this crisis behind us. So at the outset, um, we had something which is pure luck. Pure luck, uh, by that I mean we had a number uh, of uh, 
in uh, suspicious cases, which turned out to be negative, which meant uh, that uh, the first real cases occurred in the in very late January, which gave us a head start. It gave us a head start because uh, once the first cases occurred, we had the test criteria in place, we had case definitions in place, we had hygiene rules uh, and monitoring rules in place. We were um, we had been able to prepare hospitals across the country. Uh, we were able to uh, um, uh, substantially increase uh, uh, emergency hospital beds, respirators, and so forth. And in addition to that, uh, um, the um, first tests had been developed uh, by a German scientist uh, uh, by a German scientist in in Berlin who had uh, identified the DNA and developed the test even before the WHO had, um, had uh, concluded that this was um, a pandemic. So once um, the uh, DNA was defined, you could quickly develop tests, uh, and that uh, gave us yet another um, criteria. So before going to the next point, I need to tell you this. Of course, we made mistakes. Uh, we made mistakes because uh, we, carnivals took place even uh, in late February. Uh, people traveled uh, uh, for skiing holidays and big gatherings, even, uh, even though everyone knew that a pandemic was in the offing. But my experience uh, in a long professional life is that in democracies, when you need to um, garner support for unpopular decisions, you usually are only able uh, to take um, drastic action if there is um, a widely prevailing sense of urgency. That sounds terrible, but it's uh, it's um, it's the truth. That's not the case for dictatorships, as you could see in, in China, but democracies will have to explain. And I expect uh, in early February, it, it hadn't been possible uh, uh, to put forward uh, the cause uh, or the case uh, for um, uh, for locking down or closures uh, or banning uh, uh, certain events. My next point um, is, um, um, is that in a, any crisis, but also in a health crisis, uh, you need to um, uh, have a network of links between the local level, the regional level, and the federal and central level. That's true for the United States as a federal state as well. You could see how, um, um, how the differences, what the differences were between centralized states and federalized states. In Germany, um, uh, it's in our institutions, we have an institutional setup uh, and a procedural setup that allowed all the relevant levels, local, regional, federal, along with our CDC, and along uh, with NGOs uh, to uh, cooperate. This didn't exist, it, this didn't come with a crisis. It's part of our federal uh, uh, DNA. And I'm saying that to you because all of you are probably more or less involved in international politics. And that's something you don't know if, if you were not involved in as head of the uh, um, uh, uh, crisis management center in the uh, Interior Ministry during my time, I really learned how relevant uh, the um, interact, the organized uh, uh, interaction is between the various uh, federal levels. And if that is in place, uh, and if you've got long experience, it will uh, seriously improve uh, uh, your capacity to confront an unexpected crisis. I witnessed that, uh, that during the migration crisis in 2015. So what we did, uh, this worked. Uh, we uh, set up a system for monitoring, for contact tracing, uh, for testing, uh, uh, and all of that remains uh, relevant to uh, until today. Um, between March and May, uh, we did not have a close, uh, total lockdown. Uh, we did not close um, a number of our industries, for example. Of course, some of them had to uh, close if, if the value chains uh, didn't uh, work at all. But basically, uh, they continued to, uh, to operate, but retail and services, etc. They were locked down, and schools were, and universities were. And we are slowly now uh, re entering into uh, a new sort of normal, uh, 
which means a slow opening of schools uh, uh, with social distancing, uh, uh, with uh, uh, classes existing in separate universes, and we'll have to be uh, uh, we'll have to take step by step as we move on, and we have to be prepared uh, uh, um, even to return to some levels of containment uh, should the uh, um, should the development of the pandemic uh, continue. As it is. I quoted the chancellor as the chancellor has been quoted in the, in the German press today. On the economic side, uh, furthermore, uh, we have put forward two huge programs. Uh, uh, in March and in June, respectively, uh, that would prevent uh, liquidity shortages, uh, prevent uh, bankruptcies. Uh, Ambassador uh, Haber, let me just say the sound is a little better when you are moved closer to okay. the computer. Okay. Thank you. Um, so two programs uh, designed to uh, prevent uh, um, prevent bankruptcies, provide liquidity, provide liquidity to companies, uh, to keep people in the jobs, uh, jobs including by something that we call a short-term uh, working allowance, which means that the state will cover costs uh, of salaries of people who don't work or only work part-time, uh, uh, up to 60% of, uh, of the previous uh, salary, more if it's families. That's important. It's uh, something that had been set up in the crisis of 2008. Uh, so we just, it's, it's sort of uh, Keynesianism, if you like. It's like an automatic uh, um, uh, stabilizer, uh, which uh, springs into action uh, if the economy uh, uh, suffers uh, severe uh, or other uh, contractions. And the second uh, program was designed uh, to uh, incentivize uh, public and uh, private investment, incentivize consumption. So at all of that is the national level. Now turning to the European level, uh, you will have read early on uh, in, uh, in the newspaper something that is sadly true, and that is Germany, as some other European states too, in the early weeks of the crisis was very inward looking. We did what many tend to do in, uh, in times of crisis, you take care of your own and you don't much, uh, you don't give a lot of thinking to the long-term price tax that this uh, may bring. But we quickly realized that uh, because there was a huge pushback uh, by other European states uh, and you see the, uh, the pictures of coffins you saw in northern Italy just brought it home to you how um, existential this crisis was. It, it wasn't something self-inflicted. It was something, it, it wasn't a consequence of uh, economic uh, uh, policies or any policies. It, it, it happened. It was existential. And not withholding something that is key uh, for what the European Union thinks of itself, and that is solidarity, uh, will um, would have a huge price tag. And that's why we uh, uh, reshaped uh, quite quickly our policies. Uh, and I'm going to take a shortcut now uh, and set up uh, the biggest ever uh, support and recovery program uh, that the European Union has seen, uh, including for this specific case, some degree of mutualization of debt. And if you remember the uh, uh, the uh, financial crisis of 2008, you know that this was a mantra of Germany, a taboo, if you like, uh, that we would not accept mutualization of debt. Now, in this crisis, because of the specific circumstances, because of the long-term uh, 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 politi political fallout, uh, we jettisoned uh, uh, this orthodoxy uh, and uh, we put up a, a, a put forth, uh, set up a program uh, that would target uh, uh, those states which were most inflict, uh, um, affected by the crisis uh, and would uh, allow the Commission to raise money on the, internet, uh, on the financial markets uh, uh, and uh, hand out the money as loans, uh, but also uh, as, um, as grants. Uh, and that's new thinking. Countries will have to pay back, but only according to their share of the budget. So that's new too. And all in all, including the multilateral, multi and the financial framework, uh, um, you will see something like two trillion uh, US dollars um, over the course of a couple of seven years uh, that are um, designed uh, 
for handling um, and managing recovery and the return of the uh, economy, specifically concentrating, by the way, on these uh, on those areas uh, where we want to see um, a, a shift of paradigm, and that is climate change. 30% uh, of the money will go to climate change uh, related uh, projects and 20% uh, to digitization, yet another area uh, uh, where uh, Europeans cap uh, European capacity for innovation and for technological progress will probably determine uh, whether we'll still be around as economic, uh, um, uh, as a well, huge economic uh, uh, actor internationally in uh, 30 or 50 years. So that's the European side to it. Uh, there's yet another uh, side to it, and that is the international. Um, the European Union, in effect, has taken the lead uh, in shaping the international effort uh, uh, for, um, for supporting uh, um, the search uh, of, uh, for a vaccine, the access to it, uh, uh, the distribution uh, of it, uh, because um, even if we fare well, and if the United States fare well, we're part of a world that is totally interconnected and the virus will come uh, to haunt us again uh, if we don't make sure uh, uh, that um, uh, that other affected countries uh, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America will not uh, be put in a position uh, uh, to, um, uh, to do containment uh, of the pandemic uh, themselves. The European uh, actors, what we call the e Team EU, has put forward 20 billion uh, euros in order to support uh, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, support the international side uh, of handling the pandemic. I'll leave it at that. I think I, I've spoken probably too long anyway, but this is these are the three layers and all of them are interlinked. Uh, and looking at just one prism, the national one or only the European one, We'll not get it right, we'll get it wrong. Uh, and setting aside here, uh, again, the long-term costs of being inward looking as Europeans uh, and not um, uh, uh, tackling and managing uh, uh, the catastrophe that uh, Latin Americans or Africans or Asians are facing. Thank you so much for this introduction. Um, and you're so right about the multiple layers of this. So thank you for bringing in that final, that international layer. Because, um, you know, we've already known this from climate change, but the pandemic makes it so clear how, how interrelated the world is. And, you know, people flying from one place to another and going on vacation and, bringing COVID back with them. Um, so I uh, have a few questions for you before we open it up to the audience. And I want to invite people, you're welcome to write questions in the Q&A um, section here. Um, but uh, on, uh, in Germany, um, before we turn to the EU more generally, um, um, in the U.S. here, you know, we at GW and so many places, we are completely online. Um, the yes, there have been some difficult moments, but there's a very robust um, Internet infrastructure in the United States. Um, I think Germany has a little a little bit less of a robust um, digital infrastructure, particularly in part to the former East. Um, how, you know, and that leads to so many impacts. I mean, economic impacts, but also, you know, people can stay safer if they're able to conduct business or go to school online. Um, so how does, you know, how is the digital infrastructure um, um, contributing to a response or hindering a response in Germany right now? I don't think it is hindering uh, a response. Which, uh, it's true what you said. Uh, we have uh, the um, digital infrastructure is uh, not homogeneous uh, across uh, uh, Germany. 
and a viable uh, digital infrastructure is hugely important uh, for being uh, innovative in applications and uh, for being uh, uh, for being competitive. So this was something uh, that the present governor uh, government has put uh, center stage in its agenda uh, um, in uh, to, when elected uh, in two thousand and seventeen. But there are problems, and the problem is that in rural areas in particular, and in that affects in particular Eastern uh, German states, uh, it is sometimes uh, not profitable or competitive to set up broadband uh, um, uh, uh, supplies. And that why, is why the government, government is supporting uh, um, um, uh, optical uh, fiber networks uh, in Eastern German uh, uh, states, uh, it, it supports it financially, uh, and we've seen a growth of these networks in uh, some of the Eastern German, uh, uh, Eastern German states, which was much higher uh, than in other states. So we have we've identified a problem. We are tackling it, and I believe that the crisis has been a boost uh, uh, for addressing uh, that issue, which we've rightly raised. Um. Uh, here in the U.S., as you know, um, there are particular vulnerable populations to COVID-19, to, to getting it and to dying from it, are Blacks. Um, I'm wondering whether there are any areas or populations in Germany that are suffering more than others. We can see differences in several of the federal states. Uh, the big cities of Berlin and, uh, and Hamburg, for example, are particularly affected. Uh, North Westphalia, as the large, demographically largest uh, federal state, uh, is affected in particular. Bavaria has been affected in particular. Um, men have been more affected uh, than women. Uh, elderly have. Uh, have, especially in the early phase uh, of the uh, pandemic, have uh, uh, died uh, in disproportionate uh, numbers. Uh, but what we're not able to uh, do is to determine whether certain uh, uh, groups of the population, other than by gender or by uh, regional yardsticks, etc., uh, have been affected. The data uh, do not make a case for that. Um, my next question has to do with wearing a mask, um, which seems like a basic, obvious thing to do to limit the spread of COVID. But of course, uh, at least in the US, it has become po very politicized. Um, I've seen that there have been some demonstrations of people in Germany against wearing masks. Um, how widespread is the anti-mask sentiment in Germany, and is it politicized? Um, there have been a high double-digit number of demonstrations in, in Germany, um, protesting uh, all sorts of constraints, uh, including uh, masks. Uh, some of these demonstrations were very small. Uh, but there was also that infamous uh, demonstration in front of the Reichstag, uh, where very nearly 40,000 people uh, um, uh, took part in the demonstration, and that included uh, extreme right-wing people with anti-maskers, uh, Kanan uh, people, which I personally had noted for the first time in uh, uh, Germany, uh, uh, anti-maskers, anti-vaxxers. Uh, so it was... Um, a uh, very left, uh, right-wing, uh, uh, left-wing uh, extremists as well. It was a very motley array of uh, protesters, uh, and uh, it was worrisome that all of them uh, uh, found a common ground in, in protesting, uh, um, in protesting, to we say, rationality in dealing with uh, uh, the pandemic. But all in all, uh, the phenomenon uh, you can see in Germany is that people rallied around the flag. 66% uh, of uh, Germans say that they are satisfied with how the uh, government uh, has acted. Um, but as everywhere, um, 
uh, people tell me, I don't know that from my own uh, anecdotal evidence, uh, tell me that uh, you see more, uh, less and less people wearing masks, even in a city like Berlin, uh, which uh, at present uh, is hit uh, more than other cities are. So um, a sense for discipline uh, seems to fade away uh, with the lapse of time. Um, so we've been speaking a little bit about politics and uh, Angela Merkel has been widely praised both within Germany and beyond for her handling of the pandemic. After all, she is a scientist and has long been known for her calm, professional demeanor. Uh, serving as chancellor since 2005, she has said she will not run in the federal elections next year. Um, she and her party, the CDU, the Christian Democratic Union, remain very popular, indeed the most popular party by far right now, way ahead of others in polls, with the Greens in second place, the SBD in third, and the far-right alternative for Germany um, holding steady uh, in fourth place. How do you um, think that pandemic um, has affected the AFD, um, this far right party? Um, has it reduced their power in any way? Um, or do you think um, it hasn't had an impact on what so many people have been watching with um, the growth of this far right party? You, uh, you forgot the uh, Liberal Party, by the way. So there's uh, yet another party. That's why uh, saying one party is by far the most popular party uh, was not, uh, and not mentioning at the same time that we have a multi-party system and everything is relative. Uh, yes. Uh, may, uh, uh, for someone who is used to the uh, uh, bi-party uh, system in the United States, uh, 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 perhaps foggy uh, the uh, uh, the uh, put a fog on the reality. So um, for the moment, uh, the governor uh, government in which both uh, Christian Democrats and Social Democrats uh, uh, um, are included uh, um, enjoy, I must say, a, a strong streak of uh, popularity. Sixty six percent. That's um, uh, that is uh, substantial. But um, in crisis moments, that's what usually happens. Not everywhere, not always, uh, but it's something uh, that um, political scientists uh, know uh, as a characteristic feature. So I'd be careful uh, uh, to uh, extrapolate. Um, it is true that the uh, AFD uh, uh, at, uh, at present uh, is in the single digit uh, numbers, in the high. Uh, single digit numbers, uh, so it does not seem to have profited uh, from the crisis, which may be the case, uh, because it has been largely an anti-immigration, uh, anti-foreigner, uh, 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 nationalist, anti-European uh, party. And none of these issues uh, have been looming large over the uh, past months. So um, it's obvious that they are trying to weaponize uh, um, some dissatisfaction or discontent with all the constraints uh, that we are facing, uh, and they're trying to use that uh, as a boost uh, to rekindle uh, popularity. It doesn't seem to work so far, uh, although the number of 40,000 people came from across Germany, from south, east, and west, uh, so not only from Berlin, but the number of 40,000 still. Uh, uh, was um, uh, was uh, poison. Thank you. On on that question of um, um, the AfD, of course, they were initially formed um, with economic goals. Now they've stepped away from those, but they initially were formed, you know, not wanting to help bail out other European countries in the financial crisis. 
So I'm wondering, um, given, you know, you talked about this important new EU plan to um, combat um, and sort of deal with the impact of COVID-19, um, Germany, of course, um, contributes, I think, the most economically to the funding of what happens in the EU. So, um, you know, is there any indication of how um, Germans are feeling about that when Germany itself, of course, has suffered some economic consequences? And, you know, again, this old issue of how much do you help yourself versus help others? That's a very good question, Hope. And I was asking myself the question uh, when the discussions unfolded uh, about uh, the huge recovery impact. It's true. The AFD initially uh, in 2008 were um, an austerity party, uh, a party uh, that was fiercely opposed to any mutualization of debts, uh, to any uh, bailouts, uh, um, and reflected the anti-bailout narrative or thinking was also something that we would have seen at the time in other parties, in the CDU, uh, for example, certainly in the Liberal Party, uh, and so forth. So this was not uh, uh, um, that was not a fringe issue. It was actually an issue uh, which was reflective of. Uh, a tradition of uh, German fiscal conservative uh, thinking, which pointed actually to the uh, to the treaties, which uh, um, uh, which did not foresee uh, any bailouts. Um, so the question is in place: uh, Why is that different now? And uh, will that not? Why don't we have this debate now? The thing is, we basically don't. And I believe this is the case because the government. That's the the conclusion I came to when thinking about it. I believe that is the case because the government uh, had been um, credible and adamant for many, many years uh, in saying uh, and sticking to the uh, um, uh, to the no bailout agenda and uh, to the fiscal responsibility agenda. So when it now uh, came out and uh, um, uh, and took a slightly different, not completely opposed, but a slightly different position in saying, in this crisis, we need to do it. I believe it had invested substantial credibility in previous year uh, for the general public to accepting that this was an uh, extraordinary and exceptional situation uh, that required steps uh, uh, which hadn't been uh, acceptable before. So it was a long, in this sense, it was a long-term investment in um, policy change, which, by the way, is not indefinite. We're not indefinitely accepting mutualization of debts. We're not indefinitely uh, jettisoning principles of fiscal uh, uh, responsibility. There's too much uh, um, in, rooted in, our, uh, in the DNA of our political and fiscal thinking. But in this specific crisis, uh, more is needed and different approaches uh, are uh, not only necessary and called for, but also acceptable. Well, on that exact question, I've been, we've got some questions coming in and um, we have a question um, asking about um, the German balance budget, the Schwarze Null, and is Germany still, um, you know, exactly what you just mentioned, totally focused on that? Um, or um, is there any more flexibility on that in, in being able to respond to um, this crisis? Well, the uh, government has uh, stated that loud and clear. Um, in this moment, uh, uh, the black zero, the false null, uh, cannot be a center stage of our uh, uh, strategies. Uh, more is required uh, and a robust uh, approach is uh, uh, required in order to stave off uh, uh, the most monumental economic crisis uh, that Europe has seen uh, um, in, well, in very nearly a century or 90 years. So um, yes, for the moment, it will not give up fiscal uh, responsibility. 
uh, but uh, every policy has its time and context, uh, uh, context. and for now uh, we need to think big in uh, warding off uh, the crisis and in uh, facilitating uh, recovery. And recovery can't only mean uh, recovery in Germany, uh, that too of course, because we're the biggest economy in Europe, uh, but recovery uh, for the entirety of Europe. That's what we're doing. Uh, another question has come in, and this gets at one of the impacts of the pandemic, of course, is that I assume German politicians aren't coming to Washington much these days, um, and that, you know, more business is being done online. Um, and uh, so one of um, um, our listeners is asking about the current sanctions legislation underway um, in the US Congress um, about uh, Nord Stream 2, this pipeline, um, um, particularly because of um, this is bringing Russian gas and the, the, it's owned by, um, uh, largely, essentially, the Russian government, and particularly uh, in light of what's just happened with the main opposition um, leader from Russia, Alexei Navalny, uh, who was poisoned and came to Berlin for treatment and is is recovering. Um, what are there? So the questioner is asking, you know, are members of the Bundestag and Congress talking right now um, about this this issue of Nord Stream? Um, it's true uh, that most of our business uh, takes place either by phone uh, or by Zoom meetings, uh, and Zoom meetings uh, are not. Well, inevitable, uh, but uh, they're not exactly conducive uh, to, uh, uh, to negotiations. So um, there is some sort of, I wouldn't call it disconnect, because the embassy, of course, reaches out and, uh, and um, people in Congress uh, reach out, and Bundestag uh, uh, people reach out, but it's not the same as it used to be when we were able to travel and, and uh, to talk person in person. So let me turn to Nord Stream uh, because that is um, uh, an issue that has many facets. Uh, the first one is uh, it comes; it has a legacy, right? It's an old project. It has been uh, um, German imports uh, of Russian gas have always been seen critically in the United States. I remember that um, uh, from the 1980s already when I was working at the Soviet desk in the German Foreign Ministry. Um, there are a number of criticisms uh, 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 that uh, were completely legitimate. Um, it is true uh, that there have been uh, at times uh, where Russia has used uh, has used uh, gas uh, um, gas exports in order, well, weaponized gas exports by trying to coerce uh, 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 policy outcomes. They didn't never do it with us, but they did it in the past, uh, in particular with the uh, Ukraine. So Ukraine. If um, gas pipelines uh, not going through the Ukraine mean that Ukraine can be more vulnerable, that's a bad thing. Um, but a lot of off-ramps have, have been created in order to prevent uh, uh, these sort of vulnerabilities. The three uh, apartheid negotiations between the EU, uh, Russia and Ukraine, which by the way wouldn't have taken place without uh, German facilitation, which secured uh, um, the gas transit via the Ukraine, um, then the uh, adoption of the EU gas uh, directive, uh, uh, which makes it sure that Russia cannot uh, um, uh, enforce the, distant, uh, uh, the desired destination anymore uh, because the gas uh, um, enters Europe uh, and European uh, legislation uh, decided. And, uh, in addition to that, uh, nowadays you can uh, pump gas into any direction. So should Russia withhold gas uh, for one specific destination, we can pump it uh, east, west, north, uh, uh, south. Uh, that's the effect of the reverse flow. I've always listened with great respect to the criticism uh, voiced uh, with regard to um, uh, Nord Stream. 
But that's one thing I really don't quite understand. I don't quite understand how it is not um, a double standard uh, if the uh, import uh, of fossil fuels in the form of gas uh, from Russia to Germany uh, is objectionable and sanctionable, whereas the import of fossil fuels in the uh, form of uh, crude oil uh, from Russia to uh, the United States, which is more or less the same, uh, um, uh, more or less the same amounts. How is that uh, desirable and not comparable? I find there's some degree of a double standard. And my last point is um, Nord Stream, this isn't a, a German project. Uh, there are um, about 100 companies from 12 countries involved. Uh, so if we are to respond uh, to the latest ruthless uh, um, uh, Russian step, um, or Russian attempt uh, to murder um, uh, uh, a Russian citizen, uh, if we are to respond, and we will, we'll have to do it together. And uh, we'll have to talk Europeans among Europeans and Europeans with Americans. And, and there cannot be just one actor burdening uh, the, uh, uh, shouldering the burden of the uh, uh, sanctions, which, as I already said, uh, um, sometimes uh, unacceptable behavior needs a price tag. And sanctions are the loudest and strongest form of diplomatic language. And the cases where you need to take uh, uh, to adopt them and go down uh, uh, that road. But we'll have to do it together, and we'll have to do it in a way uh, 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 that uh, the uh, price and the burden of the sanctions, which will also hit us, uh, is a shared one. Thank you. We're getting all sorts of different questions and we're coming up on 10 minutes left. So um, I, uh, the, the next question comes from the Associate Dean of the Elliott School, a German citizen, Peter Rollberg, um, who is interested in hearing about whether COVID has had an impact on German relations with China. Well, um... I believe uh, observing uh, the development of Chinese behavior uh, since the outbreak of the pandemic, uh, I'd say this. Obviously, China has seen uh, uh, the uh, um, eruption of the pandemic as opening space um, uh, for it. You can see that uh, if you observe the uh, more muscular and aggressive behavior in the South China Sea, we certainly saw it. Uh, when they uh, replaced the rule of law in Hong Kong uh, uh, by an authoritarian regime uh, violating international, long-standing international treaties. Uh, you saw it in the uh, more aggressive rhetoric uh, that uh, Chinese uh, embassies um, adopted since the outbreak uh, of the crisis. Uh, so uh, in um, as a secondary effect, uh, of course, uh, it has altered uh, the uh, relationship. Germany, as the EU, uh, views China as um, a competitor, uh, as a systemic rival, and in some areas where China is simply too big to ignore, or, or would we need China uh, as a partner. We need China in dealing with climate change, uh, with biodiversity. Uh, uh, um, we need it for uh, actually identifying the reasons of the outbreak and what were the mistakes and at what, uh, at what uh, points uh, could earlier reaction have prevented uh, the outcome. Um, and for that, sort of doing, uh, dealing with these issues by excluding China or order, um, ordering uh, it off uh, will not bring us closer to any, uh, uh, to any solution or any uh, any compromise. So it has changed uh, um, uh, by dint of the crisis. Uh, after Hong Kong, uh, the aspect of China being a systemic rival has certainly uh, become stronger. Uh, but none of that means uh, that we can afford uh, to ignore China or to um, or to believe uh, that we can coerce China in moving, uh, moving into certain direction. Uh, direction. 
China is, whether we like it or not, an economic and a technological superpower, um, superpower in the region, uh, and uh, um, too big to ignore or uh, um, just uh, eclipse international interaction. So this next question comes from a female student who, uh, and this doesn't have to do with COVID, but um, uh, she asks, she says, I was really curious what Ambassador Haber's experience has been like as a woman in diplomacy, specifically given that she has held multiple high-ranking diplomatic posts that had never been held by women before. Um, well, my answer will probably not be relevant to you because I'm so much older than you. But when I entered the diplomatic service in my crew, I was uh, one of three among 30 uh, 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 new attaches, we call them, uh, at the time. So I believe at the time, no one would have expected uh, that I would, uh, um, I would be the senior, the most senior civil servant uh, of the foreign ministry, let alone of a different uh, ministry. Women were simply not uh, credited uh, for being able to do that. Um, that may have been a downside uh, at the beginning, uh, although I was always educated to ignore uh, any, any constraints of these uh, sorts. You see, as, as a little girl, uh, I was always made fun of because I was red-haired, and they called me fried eggs because of that. And I had learned from um, my father that red hair in uh, reality was the nicest hair color in the world, and all of them were um, envious. And somehow this helped me in not trusting other people to assume things about me. Also being a, one of very few women made you very visible, obviously, and that may have been uh, an advantage uh, too. So what much, much younger uh, women have to deal with today is perhaps the lingering uh, um, prejudices that still exist, and I noticed that if I go to some place where I've never been before and someone says there's the German ambassador and then people would turn to shake my husband's hand. So that still happens and these lingering assumptions are something we have to deal with. But um, I think in general it's grown much, much less acceptable and I just uh, would tell you in international politics, one of the huge advantages that men have, but in my observation, many women have, is the capacity for placing yourself in the other person's shoes and to understanding uh, where his or her vantage points are, the constraints, uh, the perceptions. And then from that, you, talk, you go on and say, how do we, how do we handle disagreements? manage them or perhaps look for uh, a compromise where is his or her limits of uh, um, uh, implementing what they want to do and where are my lim limits. I find that is something that is crucial for any development. It's something that you often cannot learn. People have it and in my observation and it's not only empathy, it's empathy and a passion for um, understanding the, complex, the complexity of the other person's uh, situation. And if you've got that, and in my experience, many women have got it, I think you're good for diplomacy. Um, the final question is going to come from me, um, and it has to do with the fact that next week we'll be celebrating 30 years since Germany united, since East and West Germany became one. Um, ongoing differences between East and West Germany continue to make headlines, but so much, um, so much progress has been made in bringing the two together. Um, uh, what would you say is the state of German unity 30 years after um, it happened on paper? And what does it mean to you personally? It 
almost the best day of my political career, uh, thinking uh, I was at the Soviet desk at the time uh, and watching uh, negotiations unfold uh, and seeing that something actually became possible that a few years earlier, people hadn't thought possible anymore. It was the vision you see had been a, a fact of life on the ground and people grew accustomed to it. And there were even some who uh, thought that uh, Peace in Europe was well served uh, by uh, two Germanys uh, uh, existing side by side. So when um, unification happened, it, it was a moment was something incredible until a short while ago, unbelievable, unexpected, um, something which had figured in many Sunday speeches, but with had the belief in it uh, actually having long eroded it was an extraordinary uh, moment and i would say uh, in the life of a diplomat you don't you don't see many truly extraordinary moments uh, that are uh, that are fundamental uh, um, fundamental changes of uh, historical development this was one and that's what it means to me of course germany is still uh, east and west a very heterogeneous uh, but it's always been also uh, south uh, uh, north um, every single federal state has its uh, features uh, its traditions uh, its uh, historical experiences so diversity in itself is not a bad thing economic diversity is uh, and diversity of uh, opinions on uh, the shared narrative. That's also uh, something that is uh, that uh, lingers on uh, and has to be uh, dealt with. But sometimes it would take uh, decades, and it did. Uh, Ambassador Haber, I want to read a beautiful thank you that has come through from a student of ours at GW, uh, Ruing Yang Zhang, who is from Wuhan, China, and is a student at GW, um, and has written, my family experienced lockdown early this year. Today, you introduced the contribution and the effort Germany has made to fight against this COVID pandemic, as well as the politics and international relations between Germany, Europe, Russia, and China. I've learned a lot. Thank you so much. And I too, and all of us uh, who are on, want to thank you so much for your time and your expertise and um uh and wish you um to to stay safe and healthy for you your family everyone at the embassy and to wish you happy 30th anniversary of german <laughs> unification next week thank you and thank you for inviting me and please all of you all who've listened in stay stay healthy Thank you and auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.